in here ready? I know I'm ready. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Stand with me. Take your songbook. Turn to 441. It's good to be saved! Amen! Amen! 441. Love lifting me. Praise the Lord. Amen. Y'all glad you saved tonight? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah, man. I tell you, I appreciate every one of you that's endured this week. Been good. You, we've had some good, Been we've good. had some really good preaching. It wasn't really enduring. It was uh, It was more of a, a uplifting. uplifting. And uh, I, I just praise the Lord for Brother Keenan. And uh, I don't know if he's going to be able to preach tonight or not as much as he ate for lunch. But anyhow, he's going to try. Oh. That's a good preaching. Hey, amen. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh. I was only embarrassed two different times eating. <laughs> Come on and preach, Brother Keenan. <laughs> Amen. It's sure good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Good to see you all out. Appreciate your faithfulness. Lord sure is good. Uh, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke to start tonight. The Gospel of Luke. How many of you know who uh, Steve Jobs is? Or was? Was. Okay, was he a saved man? No, he was not a saved man. No, saved people testify 
of knowing the Lord Jesus as their Savior. But you know, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about the children of the generation being wiser than the children of light. Now, personally, I think that's a rebuke to God's children that lost folks would be wiser than us. I have a quote. Did you know Steve Jobs would not let his children mess around with devices when they were children? Computers, iPads, iPhones. He wouldn't let them do it. This is what he said. I'm quoting him. If our current addictions to our iPhones and other tech is any indication, we may be setting up our children for incomplete, handicapped lives, devoid of imagination, creativity, and wonder when we hook them onto technology at an early age. There's a lot of wisdom in that, uh, that little statement there, amen? I'd be real careful about letting those little guys with all that technology. Amen? Amen. Do I have any Polish folks here tonight? No Polish people? Okay. I got a letter from a Polish mother to her daughter. Dear Stella, I'm writing this letter slow because I know you can't read fast. We don't live where we did when you left home. Your dad read in the newspaper that most accidents happen within 20 miles from your home, so we moved. <laughs> I won't be able to send you the address because the last Polish family that lived here took the house numbers when they moved so that they wouldn't have to change their address. This place is real nice. It even has a washing machine. I'm not sure it works too well, though. Last week, I put a load in, pulled the chain, and I haven't seen the clothes since. <clears throat> the weather here isn't bad. It only rained twice last week. The first time for three days, and the second time for four days. That coat you wanted me to send you, your Uncle Stanley said would be too heavy to send in the mail with the buttons on it. So we cut the buttons off and we put them in the pockets. <laughs> somebody said, somebody this week said to me, said, if you didn't do anything else, at least you got Mrs. Rowan laughing this week. <laughs> Uh, John locked his keys in the car yesterday. We were, we were real worried because it took him two hours to get me and your father out. <laughs> your sister had a baby this morning, uh, but we haven't found out what it is yet, so we don't know if you're an aunt or an uncle. <laughs> <laughs> uncle Ted was working, and he fell in a whiskey vat last week. Some men tried to pull him out, but he fought him off <laughs> and drowned. We had him cremated. He burned for three days. <laughs> three of your friends went off a bridge in a pickup truck. Ralph was driving. He was able to roll the window down and swim to safety. But your other two friends were in the back. They drowned. They couldn't get the tailgate down. There isn't much more news at this time. Nothing much has happened. Love, Mom. P.S. I was going to send you some money, but the envelope was already sealed. <laughs> Amen. I'm in the Gospel of Luke. Let's go to chapter 23, if you would, please. I would like to say thank you, New Testament. I appreciate the invitation from Pastor Rowan to come and be with you all. And uh, it is our heart's desire and our prayer that uh, we were able to help, encourage, and uh, be a blessing to you. I want to thank uh, Brother Ronnie and Miss Sue for putting up with me this week, letting me stay there, feeding me. Preacher took me out. I thank you for everything. I really appreciate your hospitality and your kind words. And uh, you all will be on my prayer list. And if you'd like to pray for me, I could sure use it. Amen. And I would appreciate it very much. Let's stand together and we'll honor the reading of the Word of God. We're in Luke chapter 23. I'm going to pick up in verse number 
uh, 39, Luke 23 and verse 39. The Bible says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Brother Ronnie, how about praying for us? Lord, just touch them and move them, Lord, and just touch people in church, Lord, and touch your hearts and minds, Lord, and treat us what you need, Lord, and just ask you, just be with us tonight, Lord, and just ask us in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. I just preached this at the, ha at the house uh, just a few weeks ago, and uh, the Lord's laid it on my heart to preach. When I was home, we started in Luke chapter 15 where the prodigal was. And you know the prodigal went up to his daddy and he said, give me. And you know, guys, if our children, if all they do is say, give me, they have a prodigal's heart. And you should be forewarned about that. But there's no, there's no sadder news that a mom or dad gets than that the prodigal says, give me, and then heads for the far country. And uh, it'll break your heart. It'll cause depression. And then the devil, the adversary, he will invade our minds and he will attack us like he's never attacked us before. Because those of us that are saved, he has lost our soul for time and eternity. What he wants to do is ruin our lives here on earth and keep us from serving and living for the Lord Jesus Christ. He plays by no rules, uh, he has no boundaries. And so he will attack the wounded. He will attack those that have been hurt. And so what, what uh, the Lord uh, really laid on my heart is that these two thieves had parents. Man, nobody wants their children to grow up and end up like that. Convicted thieves, crucified for their deeds. But he... Their mom and dad had to be downhearted and depressed. They had to feel like a failure. Now, since I'm preaching, this is what I'm going to do tonight. I am going to, up north we call it, wax eloquent. What that means is since I'm preaching, and since I don't have all the information about that, I'm going to make some supposes about this passage that we've read. And what I'm going to suppose is that one thief's mom and dad were saved. That one thief's mom and dad were good Jewish folks who loved the Lord and wanted to live for God. You say, well, you can't prove that through Scripture. Oh, you can't prove it not. And so, like I said, since I'm, I'm, I'm not teaching this as doctrine, I'm preaching and trying to drive home a point. And so, uh, why? The question is why? If his mom and dad are good Christians, good churchgoers, faithful at the house, doing what they know to do, why did that boy turn out that way? And you know what our generation is looking to do? They're looking to blame somebody. I call it the blame game. What well, was the pastor's fault? Well, it was the assistant pastor's fault. Well, it was the neighbor's fault. Well, it was the Sunday school teacher's fault. They're trying to put the blame out there. Well, I don't think that's going to float before our Lord. Romans chapter 14, verse 12 says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. I want, I want you to keep your finger in Luke. I'm, I'm not trying to trick you, but up until this time, up until today, 
Has God saved every soul that was born into the world? Well, He's God. He died for them. He loved them. But see, He couldn't save them all. Why? Because He gave man free will. A choice. Look with me. Keep your finger there in Luke. And with, go with me back to uh, Isaiah chapter 1, if you would. Isaiah chapter 1. Look at Isaiah 1. Look at verse number 2 with me. Verse number 2. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. Now this is God. I. Who's the I? That's God the Father. I have nourished and brought up children. What kind of job do you think God does as a father? The best. He's the best. There's no fault with him. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have what? They rebelled. Good night of living, guys. If they rebelled against Almighty God... We cannot lose our salvation. We cannot be devastated when our own children make choices of their own as young adults and make wrong decisions. Let me my favorite prophet in the Old Testament is Samuel. I like Samuel. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 8. I personally think Samuel is the greatest Old Testament prophet. He took those Jews from a dark, dark period and brought them through revival with God and the establishment of the kings. And I just, I love Samuel, God's man. Man, he said when he was getting ready to die, what did he say? He said, if anybody in Israel has anything against me, if I took anything or if I did anything wrong, speak up now. And the whole nation said what? He was God's man. His words never even fell to the ground. I'm in chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, verse 1. <clears throat> and it came to pass, 1 Samuel 8, verse 1. And it came to pass when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre chased after money, and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. You know, if any of my kids are living for God, it's only the grace of God. If there's any human blame to go around for my kids not doing right, I would take that blame. If there's any human uh, commendation for them doing right, I'd give that to my wife. But the long and the short of it is, our kids live for the Lord. It's the grace of God. Those of my children that are living for the Lord, faithful in the house of God, trying to bring their kids up right, they made their own decisions. They made their own, their own choices. If you have children that are living for God or not living for God, your children made the choices. Are we okay? You know what I could take? I could take five young men from this church and what I could do is I could teach them to be carpenters. Or I could teach them to be computer and I could teach them to be anything. Give them the best instruction in the world in whatever field that is. But three years down the road doesn't mean those guys are going to be doing that for which they were trained to do. I said, why? They would have to want to do it. Amen. And make the decision to do it. Amen. Do you follow me? 
He said, uh, remember in the Gospel of Matthew, you have the uh, parable of the sower and the seed, Matthew 13. The first is the wayside. The seed is on, they got thrown on the wayside. That's where the wicked one takes the seed out of the hearts. The second place is stony places. That's, uh, there's no root in the heart. It withered. The third place was thorns, where the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choked the word. And then the fourth ground was the good ground, where it brought forth fruit, some 100, some 60, some 30. You all with me? Amen. Remember, in the beginning of the, the, the conference, I told you all, it's, it's vitally important that you believe the Bible is the word of God. Because what I'm preaching is the word of God. Amen. I'm taking incorruptible seed and I'm trying to get it down into your hearts. But see, I can't control what kind of heart you have. You can't control the kind of heart your children have. And so depending on the condition of our hearts is whether or not we receive the word and it brings forth fruit for the glory of God. Amen. Am I making any sense here? Could I, could I illustrate again? Think about our Lord. He had 12 hand-chosen apostles. And then he had somewhere in the area 70, 80 disciples. And he preaches one message in John chapter 6. And his congregation goes from about 90-something to 12. <laughs> that was our Lord. Then out of 12... You had John, the beloved. Then you had the inner circle, so-called, you know, Peter, James, and John. that were closer to the Lord, you know, Mount of Transfiguration, all that kind of stuff. Man, it's up to the individual to make a decision. Remember, remember the story in John chapter 9? There was a man blind from his birth. And the disciples asked the Lord, they said, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What did the Lord say? Neither. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Amen. Like I said, we like to blame somebody for our children doing wrong or our children going the wrong way or something like that. And I don't think you ought to do that. In my life, there's no blame for anybody but me. Nobody, nobody can make me bitter if I don't want to be bitter. Nobody can make me angry if I don't want to be angry. Nobody can make me quit if I don't want to quit. Nobody can make me compromise or sin if I don't want to compromise or sin. Nobody can run me off from church if I don't want to be run off. Y'all with me? I, I just don't get into that. So what, what I want to preach to you tonight is that in my opinion, one of these thief's parents was not a failure as a parent. Where the whole world would look at that boy on that cross Say he was a thief, he lived a criminal's life, and now he's getting what he's deserved. And that's all true. And they'd say, his parents did a lousy job. And I say, that's not true. I say, that's not true. You know what I'd like to tell, you know what I'd like to tell young parents? If y'all do right, if you discipline your children, if you set a good example and you just do right, everything will turn out right for you. But you know what? That ain't true. That is not true. Hey, look at King Saul. King Saul started out pretty good, but he ended up a mess. Look what he produced, Jonathan. Buddy, I have a lot of respect for Jonathan. Do you know who was in line to be king after Saul? Jonathan. But he was such a man of character that he saw God's hand on David, and he said, David, you... And he was the one who strengthened David's hand in God's hand when David was ready to quit. Saul produced that. Man, I know a lot of preachers, better preachers than me, better daddies than me, smarter than me, did better than me. And their kids aren't doing right. 
I know one Christian family, and I'm telling you, pastor to good church, good family, good wife, the whole nine yards. Do you understand? And that one of those boys is a sodomite today. A sodomite. Then I know this kid. I call him a kid. He's not a kid. He's a grown man. He's a missionary. Mike Gibson from West Virginia. Mike Gibson's mom and dad were bootleggers. Uh, they were gamblers. And the way they made their living was they would torch their house and collect the insurance money, build another one, and torch it and collect some more insurance money. Well, they caught up to him and they did time in a federal prison. And so Mike grew up with drinking and gambling at the house seven days a week, uh, all the time. And one day, a Baptist preacher walked up that dirt path to that mountain house, and Mike was just a boy, and invited him out to church. And that pastor picked him up and started carrying him to church. And a few weeks after that, Mike got saved by the grace of God. Mike's mom and dad never got saved. His brothers and sisters never got saved, but Mike got saved. Mike carried his Bible to the public school. Mike took a stand for the Lord. He dressed right. He walked right. He lived right. Went to the house of God. That pastor made sure he got to teen camp every summer he was in high school. Mike uh, went to Tennessee Temple College years ago, got called to preach, and he was called to be a missionary. Mike married a girl. He met at one of those camps at Tennessee Temple, good godly girl, and he's got five or six or seven kids and living for God. But his parents were bootleggers. They were criminals. And that boy got saved and turned out. There's another boy I know, Billy Norton. He's a missionary in Mexico, been a missionary in Mexico for 20 years. Used to live in Oklahoma, got picked up on the bus route. His mom never got saved. His daddy never got saved. His brothers and sisters never got saved. He rode that bus. He got saved, went through public school, went to uh, that Oklahoma college, was called to preach, married a good Christian girl, and is living for God. Are y'all getting what I'm trying to get at here? Everybody has a free will. And what we need to do as parents is we want to equip them so they can make the right decisions in life. And so what I want to do is I want to preach that if you will put five things into your children, you'll never be a failure as a parent. You know, sometimes advantages... We say, well, you know, that kid had great advantages. Well, just having advantages doesn't make it work, guys. You know, you could take that great prophet Elijah, and he took Elisha under his wing. Well, I wouldn't mind carrying Elijah's bags for a few years, would you, preacher? Boy, that would have been a privilege. And you know, when God was going to take Elijah up, Elijah said, you see the Lord take me out of here. Uh, ask what you will. And he said, I want a double portion. Of that touch of God on you. Well, Eli you check it out, count them. Elisha did two times the miracles that Elijah did. He was God's man. And who was his sidekick? Gehazi. Well, Gehazi had even more advantages than Elisha had because he's running with Elisha, a man with a double portion. How'd Gehazi turn out? Not so good. Do you understand what I'm trying to get at here? I, my children, they got to sit on the laps of some of the finest preachers, missionaries that lived in our generation. They got to hear some of the greatest preachers of our time. I'd say that was advantages. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your children have had advantages that others have not had. But just having advantages does not pave the way for them to make the right decision. So what I'm trying to preach is five things that if you put in your children, whatever choices your kids make, you're not a failure. I'm in verse 39 of uh, Luke chapter 23, if you turn there, please. <clears throat> Luke 23, verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. 
Verse 40. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Hey, he says, Dost not thou fear God? Where did this thief get the fear of God? I mean, did he get it from the other thieves he was running around? No. Did he get it from the streets? No. I'm telling you, his mom and daddy put the fear of God into that man. And he may have gone astray. He may have gone to the far country. But I'm telling you, when it came down to the end, he had the fear of God in him. We need to put the fear of God in our kids. One of the reasons I got saved, I'm sure of it, is my mom and dad put the fear of God in me. I said, how'd your mom and dad put the fear of God into me? They whooped my butt is how they did it. Amen. Amen. They set the rules. They set the standards. And if I didn't meet them, they whooped my butt. That's right. Are you all with me? Amen. Now look up here. You can go ahead and sour up about spanking because you watch too much TV or listen to these liberals. But that is a word of God. And when you lay the rod down in your home, you are opening the door for the devil himself to come in and rule and reign in your home. Buddy, somebody's going to run your home. And I determined it wasn't going to be my mother-in-law. It wasn't going to be the children. It's going to be me. Say amen right there. Come on, I'm going home tomorrow. So, I mean, just endure until the end and thou shalt be saved. Amen. Uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter. Keep your finger now. My text is going to be Luke 23. But go to Hebrews with me, if you would, please. Chapter 12. And look at verse 28 with me. You know the Bible as well as I do, guys. The beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of the Lord. The beginning of knowledge is what? The fear of the Lord. Go through the book of Proverbs, verse after verse after verse, talking about the fear of the Lord. I'm in uh, Hebrews 12, verse 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with what? Reverence and godly fear. The old dictionary talks about the fear of God. It said this, and I'm quoting. In good men, the fear of God is a holy awe or reverence of God in his laws which springs from a just view and a real love of the divine character, talking about God, leading the subjects of it to hate and shun everything that can offend such a holy being and inclining them to aim at perfect obedience. It is also the effect or consequence of guilt. It is the painful apprehension of merited punishment. You need to put the fear of God. When the first church I, I pastored, uh, we were meeting in homes for a while. We had a storefront and that kind of stuff. And then we started using a Grange Hall. And uh, <clears throat> had a man in my church that I had uh, uh, helped and, and trained and stuff like that. So I had him teach the adult Sunday school. It's the first class. It's the first time I ever did that after a few years. So you know what I did? I took the nursery. Because I wanted the men and the, I wanted the ladies to be in Sunday school, you know, and I had other ladies teaching some Sunday school class, didn't have a big church or anything like that. So I took the nursery. What a learning experience. Do you know why you have nursery workers? Because if you didn't, those kids would kill one another. Murder, mayhem. But I learned. Every mother brought in their diaper bag, had their little paddle or their little wooden spoon or their little rod of correction in there. Everyone did. But not everyone used it. I could, if a kid started messing around, I'd go grab that kid's uh, paddle and I'd go, you better straighten up. And some of those kids fear would fill their eyes and they'd just stop. What did I know? Their parents were using that thing. And they were afraid they were going to, that's a fear of God. But you know what I did sometimes? Sometimes I'd grab a kid's paddle and go, you better stop messing around. That kid go, goo goo, ga ga, grab the paddle like it was a toy or something. 
What did I know about that parent? They weren't using it. Are we doing okay? But you better put the fear of God in those kids. Well, you know, I want to be my kid's friend. Look up here. That is a worldly philosophy. And if that's what you think, your kids don't need a friend. Your kids need a parent. They need a mother. And can I say that they need a good, mean mother. So what do you mean by that? What I mean by a mean mother is a mother that will say no. A mother that will put them on a schedule and make them do things. And if they don't do it right the first time, do it over again. And if they disobey, take that paddle and put it on the seat of learning. Set the fire alarms off for crying out loud. Amen. I, the, where, where I got that is I had an old man come by my church. His name was Brother Elzinga. Clarence Elzinga was in the track ministry. And he wrote a track. We need more mean mothers. Well, I thought the same thing you did. I said, this guy's a nut. What's he talking about, mean mind? And then I read us, oh, that's good preaching. I think I'll preach that. Amen. 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 I want to put the fear of God. Can I tell you a story? Great friend of mine, Hank Thompson. Hank was raised in the mountains of Colorado, very, very poor. His mom... His mom married this man. He had a bunch of kids, and he was a drunk, and he was a mess. And, and the only child this, this lady had to him was Brother Hank, and there's a bunch of other kids, though. And uh, he, he left her, and he'd just come back to the house and just steal her money. She worked two full-time jobs to take care of business. He'd come back, and he'd slap her around and steal her money. And, but she was a Christian lady. And Hank was in the fifth grade. And two of his buddies came over one summer night, and they were going to have a camp out. And so they put their tent up, and uh, I can, Hank is in heaven. Hank was a close friend. And it was uh, Robbie and Kenny, I can remember, him telling me the story. And so, of course, they didn't sleep in the tent. They ran through the neighborhoods, and they got into mischief. And, and the mischief in those days, you know, like people would have those things in their yards like flamingos and... You know, they'd pull it out of one yard, go around the block and stick it in somebody else's yard, you know. And, and one guy had a trailer, and they pulled the trailer down the street and put it in somebody else. And then they let tire, air out of the tires. And so they spent the whole night doing that kind of foolishness, you know. Well, the sun is just about to come up. And down the street from Hank's house, they're coming back. There was a tent in the front yard. And there was an apple tree. So they figured they'd get these apples and chuck them at the tent. So they're chucking at, well, this guy jumps out of the tent. What it was is the people who lived there, their son was a New York City police officer. And he was sleeping in the tent with his kids. And he jumps out. And these guys were just expecting kids, but it wasn't a kid. And he caught one of them. So Hank went home, but they caught, I think they caught Kenny. And so he's home and he's just, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get in trouble. Next thing you know, a police car comes up. And Hank looks out and goes, oh, no. And his mom goes out. Now, what he noticed is that his mother was talking to this officer. And uh, it was just a little prankish stuff. And, you know, the officer was just going to warn uh, Hank and everything. But his mother goes, would, uh, would you please do me a favor? And she said, he said, well, if I can. He said, I want you to scare my son so bad, he will never think about doing this again. I want you to go in there and arrest him. I want you to put handcuffs on him. I want you to take him out to the car. I want you to drive him down to the police station. I want you to put him behind bars. He said, she said, and that's not all. She says, Monday, when he goes back to school, I want you to go to school knock on the door when he's in the classroom and I want you to arrest him in front of all his friends and threaten to take him to jail that he won't see his mom for the rest of his life. <laughs> so that cop comes in and all he knows so far is that these kids were chucking apples at this tent. That's all they know. 
So he sits down, he sits Hank down, fifth grade. He said, okay, boy, I caught your friends and they ratted you out. We know everything you do, so I'm giving you one chance to tell the truth. So he says, yes, sir. We, we, we moved the flamingos and we let the air out of the tire. And he names everything they did. And he goes, and what else? Uh, no, that's, we don't know, we, I know we did it. This guy is putting it on him like ugly on a gorilla. No, 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 no. And, he, and so he just keeps, he's a, if you're not honest with me, I'm dragging you down to the jailhouse right now. So he says, well, a couple weeks ago, I shoot my BB gun and knock some lights out down at the liquor store. And, and then one time I told my teacher I didn't do my homework. I did my homework, but I didn't do it. And he's confessing to everything. So he said, that's it. Get up. He handcuffs him, puts him in the police car, takes him down to jail, takes him, puts him in the cell, and he leaves him there for over three hours. Fifth grade. His mom, trying to put the fear of God in this boy. He said that police officer brought him out, took him into a little room. You should have heard him telling the story. He says, there really is those little rooms with the tables down at the jailhouse. <laughs> And he grills him again. And he's thinking, where's Kenny? Where's Robbie? Why are they ratting me out here? I haven't said nothing about them. So the long and the short of it is, Monday, goes to school, midway through Monday morning, knock on the door. There's the cop. Pulled him up, handcuffed him in front of his friends, told him that they were driving him down, said, Son, and see, when he first took him to jail, he says, I don't know how long you're going to be in jail. I don't know if you ever see your mom again. He's in the fifth grade. He's scared to death. This is what he said. He said they, they never told him that his mom did all like that, you know. So his friends, they'd say, come on, let's do this. And they'd go, we're going to get in trouble, but it'll be worth it. Hank goes, it ain't worth it to me. I'm not doing it. better put the fear of God in those kids. You put the fear of God in those kids. And reverence. It says there, godly fear and reverence. I don't think reverence and godly fear are the same thing. You see, Sunday, I think Sunday's the Lord's Day. And I think at your house, it shouldn't be, are we going to go to church today? It ought to just be accepted. Sunday is the Lord's Day. We don't go swimming. We don't go to the ball games. We go to the house of God. We don't go to family picnics. We go to the house of God. That is the Bible. You don't throw the Bible around like it's a normal book. That is the holy word of God. Hey, hey, we live like this because we love the Lord. There's a reverence about the things of God. Everything is about the Lord. The Lord isn't something you take out on Sunday morning and pack up Sunday afternoon and forget about him the rest of the week. So you put the fear of God and the reverence of God and the things of God in them. When they run to that far country, they got a mountain of truth that they got to crawl over to get there. If you put the fear of God and the reverence of God. Think about this thief. Don't I fear God? I'm going to die. He couldn't get away from the fear of the Lord. And like I said, he didn't learn that fear of the Lord from his thieving buddies. I believe that mom and dad put it in him. And he made a bad choice in life sometime, went down that far road. The second thing, if you don't want to be a failure as a parent that you should put into your children, is that, look what, look what he says there in verse uh, 41. And we indeed what? Justly. We indeed justly. You know what else he learned from his mom and dad? You have to reap the consequences. My generation said it this way. You have to pay the piper. You have to teach your children. Hey, have you heard this lately? Safe sex. You know what they're really trying to say? Safe sin. You know, the book of Romans talks about that we're supposed to magnify the sinfulness 
of sin. But in America, what they're doing is they are just trying to get the sinfulness of sin out of the way so that people don't think there's any consequences to sin. Hey, the wages of sin is death. Look at your Bibles with me at Galatians chapter number 6. This is a supernatural and a natural law. Galatians chapter number 6. We need to teach our children that they're going to reap the consequences of their actions. Galatians 6 verse number 7. The Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap what? Corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Hey, listen to me. There's a law of sowing and reaping. There's the law of the harvest. Number one, you reap what you sow. Number two, you reap more than you sow. And number three, you reap later than you sow. I want to tell you parents, if all you do is threaten your children yell at your kids, scream, call them names. You are teaching your children there's no consequences to life. Right. We did not believe in screaming at the kids. We believed in telling them, go up to the bedroom. And then we took care of business. Amen. There's consequences to disobedience, is there not? Listen to me, the nicest person you know that's not saved, the sweetest lady you know, the most generous man you know that's lost and on his way to hell, where is he going to go? Where is she going to go if they don't get saved? They're going straight to hell. They'll wake up in hell. The preacher was telling me today when he was working in a bus ministry that uh, uh, he went to visit a little girl that uh, he was picking up and he tried to witness to the dad and really didn't even witness to him much, just invited him out to church. And the man cussed him out. The man cussed God out and uh, ran him off. I mean, cussed him out. He went to pick up the little girl Sunday morning. She was real sad. She said, what's the matter? He asked her, what's the matter? She said, my daddy had a heart attack. He's in the hospital. Before the preacher could ever get to the hospital, the man died. Man, what a way to wake up in hell after cussing God and cussing a servant the Lord sent his way to try to tell him how to get saved, huh? All time and eternity, that's the last minutes that you remember in life. There's consequences to sin. No, but we're trying to soft soap sin. I'm telling you, you're teaching your kids there's no consequences. When you stick up for your children, hey, there's people that will believe a child over an adult. You know, the kids will come home from Christian school and say, that teacher did such and such. And the teacher didn't do anything like that. And dumb, stupid parents will believe the child over the the Christian school. Say amen right there. Buddy, I've been around the block. I've, I've had two different Christian schools. You understand what I'm talking about? Kids are liars. They're sneaks. They're snaky. You know where they get it from? Mom and dad. <laughs> Are we okay here? Amen. Lord have mercy. Put up. Man. It's, you, you need a brain transplant if you're always trying to cover up or make what your kid did wrong look like it's right. There's consequences to sin. Huh? I remember the first time one of my kids shoplifted something from Walmart. I was devastated. I said, you what? You're a thief? He said, what did you do? Packed them in the car, took them to Walmart, and, and got the manager. And I said, okay, tell them what you did. He said, I stole these sunglasses. I said, well, tell them what you're going to do. He said, I'll pay for the glasses, but I'm giving them back. And if you want me to scrub floors or clean toilets, I mean, I told him, you got to make this right. And I said, this guy could call the cops. And if he calls the cops and has you arrested, I ain't doing nothing about it because you're a thief. Oh, daddy, daddy, I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah, you're sorry now because you got caught. You should have thought about this before. Oh, daddy, don't let him take me to jail. You might need to go to jail. Oh, I don't want to go to jail. I said, you should have thought about that when you're stealing those glasses. Amen. Say amen. Amen. Man. 
Make them pay it back. Make it right. Restitution. Amen? Hey, listen, if, if, if our young people disrespect people, there should be a price to pay. If our young people disobey, there should be a price to pay. If they lie, cheat, steal, there's a price to pay. People, there's a real hell. Did you ever notice how hard it is to witness to people about sin anymore? You know why? Because those people have gone through life with no consequences to their sin. So you're telling them they're going to go to hell because they're sinners. Their whole life has been one of no consequences for doing wrong. They don't believe you. Buddy, when that man told me I was going to hell because I was a sinner, I knew what punishment was. I knew what the law was. Do you understand what I'm saying? I didn't want to go to hell and burn forever. That's why I got saved. People are getting away with things today, and it's just hard to get them saved because there's no consequences. I want to ask you a question. This is a question I ask myself. Am I getting what I deserve? Yeah, but when's the last time something bad happened to you? And you go, I don't deserve this. No, you know, the fact of the matter is we deserve worse than that. Amen? You talk about the grace and the mercy of God. Buddy, we have the grace and the mercy of God. So you want to instill the fear of the Lord and reverence. You want to instill in your children that there's consequences to their actions. There's consequences to their sins. The wages of sin is death. We need to equip our children so they can make the right decisions. Look at verse 41, back in Luke 23. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our sins. So he believed that. But this man hath done what? Nothing amiss. You know what we need to teach our children if we don't want to be a failure? To have compassion on others. This is the most self-centered, selfish generation that America has ever seen. When your child thinks he or she is the only one right in life, you have raised a hopeless person. If they only feel sorry for themselves, if they never consider others, they're a hopeless person. I remember I was in grade school and uh, we had a football team, and we had our big uh, rivalry. It was another private Catholic boys' school, and we played at their place, and uh, I, had a, I was a running back. I was real little, but I was pretty fast, and so uh, I scored the winning touchdown, and the kids carried me off the field, and I was feeling pretty good about that. Well, when I got off my field, my mom came to the game and watched the game, and I came, and I said, Mom! And before I could say anything else, she goes, Michael, she says, the only reason you scored that touchdown is because Charlie was out there blocking for you and Mark was blocking for you. And she goes through the lineup, okay, saying it wasn't you, Michael. It was those other kids helping you get across that goal line. Y'all with me? Ever since I can remember as a kid, both mom and dad were big on us helping other people. Helping my grandmother, helping our neighbors, take care of this business, help, help this person with this. If, if I was outside playing and a neighbor was carrying groceries in, my father would say, Michael, what are you doing? Get over there and help them carry those things in. We can't get our kids off their devices to come eat dinner, let alone go help somebody. There's no compassion. There's no desire to help others. I was all about that. How about respect and manners? I remember as a 30-year-old man calling my neighbor Mr. Scherzer. And he looks at me and he goes, Michael, you're 30 years old. You can call me Bill. But buddy, it was just in me to respect older people. And the thought of calling some people by their first name just did not compute with me. And about running and jumping in front of women, going through a door, or knocking people over, or something like that, daddy would knock me into next week. But this generation, they'll run over a lady with a cane 
just so they can get out the door. And I ain't talking about the world. I'm talking about church kids. Amen. Amen. No respect. Remember I talked to you about Hank Thompson? First time I met Hank Thompson, I was at a uh, uh, camp meeting in Houston, Texas, Shady Acres Baptist Church. And there was a young man, and I had preached. And that young man came up to me. He was 14 years old. And he came up to me after I preached, and he said, he said, Pastor Keenan, he said, that was good preaching, uh, sir. He said, my name is Travis Lewis. He says, I go to uh, uh, Capital City Baptist Church. He said, my pastor is Brother Hank Thompson. He said, my daddy's an evangelist. He's Brother Jerry Lewis. He's a full-time evangelist. And he said, that, and he stood there, a 14-year-old boy, and he talked to me and had an adult conversation, looked me in the eye, asked me about my church, asked me about where I live, told me about himself for about 10 minutes. I was like, I can go to a church and preach Sunday through Friday and teenagers in that church come every service and never even say hello to me. The visiting preacher. I said to him, I said, who's your pastor? He said, Hank Thompson. I said, who's your daddy? He said, Jerry Lewis. I sought them out. I said, I, I, I need to get to know you guys. If that's what you're producing, I want to find out how you produce that. Are we okay? Yeah. Can I ask you a question? I'm not trying to dent anybody's fenders here. Do you like brats? I can't stand a brat. Okay? It makes me nervous. Hey, how about this? When they go from the brat stage, what's the next stage they get to? Punks. Am I speaking the same language? How many of y'all like a punk? Yeah, me neither. Me neither. But you know what we're raising in the church? Brats and punks. That's our fault, people. That's not what we should be bringing up. We okay? Buddy, I'm on my kids at church just like they're my own kids. I will, I will call them out while I'm preaching. I will get in their face and call them everything under the sun. And their parents are sitting there going like this. Amen. Amen. Some of you all, if a preacher got in front of your kids' oh, face, yeah. you'd be offended. Yes. And you'd be raising holy H-E double hockey stick when what that preacher's trying to do is help your kid get equipped Amen. to make the right choices in life. Ought to teach those kids to have compassion. One of the things that Brother Hank helped me with is he said, Preacher, he said, what you want to do with those kids is you want to develop a servant's heart in them. Your pastor has a servant's heart. Oh, yeah. Miss Darlene has a servant's heart. Right? Yes. And I'm sure many of you have a servant's heart. But what we want to do is put that into our kids. How do you do that? How do you put a servant's heart? You serve with them. And you don't never gripe about it. You don't never complain about it. You always lift it up. You always look what we got to do for Jesus Christ. Look at the blessing that we can be to so-and-so. Look how we can help somebody. God lets us help somebody. Amen. Man. I want to put a servant's heart into him. Guys, we're the body of Christ, are we not? We're supposed to work together, correct? We're supposed to care for one another. There's this, there's this boy in my church. Let me think now. Trying to think, I think he's in, uh, he's in eighth or ninth grade. And this boy, I'm five foot nine, this boy is at least six foot one now. And I have been reading him the riot act since he was a toddler. He has always been a pure D rebel. And uh, 
our kids went to a Bible competition, and they were, uh, they were in the top five. And uh, this boy, he, he was lazy. He didn't memorize his verses like he should. He didn't meet the requirements. He didn't keep a B average in school. And he has an I don't care attitude. And his folks, they whoop him. They discipline him. They work with him. But he's just a rebel. And when those kids, if that boy had done what he was supposed to do, he would have quizzed with that team. And he could have helped them get into the finals for the national uh, competition. When I saw him at church, I took him aside. And of course, I have to look up to him, but I jerked his chin, I pulled him to my face. And I said, because of your laziness, because of your self-centered attitude, those kids worked hard all year, and because you're a lazy bum, because you only care about yourself. Well, by now, the tears are running down his face, you know. And I said, and I said you, got, you got next year. You could start memorizing verses for next year. You could make a change in your life. And I let him go. I want him to know I was not happy with him. And so after church, I went up to him. I said, Daniel, and he went to the altar. I said, Daniel, do you know why I get on your case like I do? He goes, yes, sir. I said, why? He goes, because you love me. <laughs> and I do. I pray for him every day. I've watched him grow up in my church. I want to equip him with the help of his mom and dad to make the right choices in life. Amen. See, he's only thinking about himself. I don't feel like studying. It's about others, too. Are we okay? Amen. That's the third thing. Number four, look at verse 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, whoa, Jesus, Lord, you all know Lord's a title, right? And what's it saying? What's that title say? He's God. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Where's this thief on a cross learning that Jesus is God? His thieving buddies are telling him? No. Mom and daddy put it in him. Jesus is God. He learned from his parents about a savior, a messiah. The fourth thing you want to put into those children is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now listen to me. I, I, I'm just going to ask you, would you please be wise with these children? Anybody can take a three, four, five, six-year-old child, say, you want to go to hell? No. Well, pray this prayer. And they'll pray a prayer. That's not salvation. If there's no conviction, there's going to be no salvation. I don't care what they pray. Amen? But you give them the gospel. You tell them about the love of God. You tell them about sin. You tell them about Calvary. Tell them about the blood atonement. You equip them with the knowledge that the Holy Ghost will take from here and put down to here someday that they'd get born again by the Holy Ghost of God. My son, my son David, I can't remember exactly how old he was, 16 maybe or somewhere around that age. And, it was Wednesday, and we had eaten dinner, and uh, I was up going over my message, and, and so he comes up and knocks on the door. He said, Daddy, can I talk to you? I said, sure. He said, Daddy, I'm not saved. He said, I want to get saved. I said, really? He said, yes, sir, and tears don't come. I said, oh, that's great. I said, hey, we're going to church. I said, uh, you can just come down the invitation and get saved. He said, no, Daddy. He said, uh, I, I want to get saved now. I said, well, that's good, David. I said, you know, tell me what the Lord said. And he told me about God convicting him and all that kind of stuff. I said, that's just great, son. I said, we'll just wait till we get to trend. Daddy, I want to get saved now. Okay. You all with me? Yeah. Uh, you shouldn't talk your kids into praying a prayer. Right. You make them twofold more the child of hell. But you ought to equip them with the knowledge, the information they need about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what, these, these parents, they told them about Christ, they told them about the Messiah, they told them about the Savior. And so you know what he did? 
He believed. You need to teach. You know what that thief thought? It's never too late to get saved. It's never too late to come to the Lord. Hey, what did he say? What did he say? He said, remember me when thou comest into thy what? Where did he learn about a kingdom? Mom and dad. Told him about the kingdom of heaven. You know that those parents, those parents weren't a failure. In the last point, verse number 42, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Is that what you prayed when you got saved? <laughs> no, me neither. You know what? It's not exactly the words, is it? With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made. The fifth thing that you ought to put into those children is how to pray. And when I say how to pray, I am not talking about saying the right words. I mean, some people are pretty eloquent when they pray. Oh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about knowing there's a father in heaven who loves you. And he hears your every prayer. And he's concerned about you. And he wants to answer your prayers. You know, what he, you know what he knew? Hanging on a cross, he knew he could talk to God. And God would hear him. And God would answer him. He had confidence. His mom and dad put confidence that the Lord would hear and answer. That thief understood something about God, heaven and hell, sin, mercy, faith, uh, prayer. Because of a mom and dad who put some things into that boy when they were raising him. My personal opinion, and I feel like the Lord put this message in my heart, is that if you put those five things in your children's lives, they have everything they need to make right decisions and right choices in their life. You think those parents felt like a failure when they're standing at the foot of the cross? You know they did. We have been there. Some of us that our children have gone to the far country felt like a failure. But you know the great, the great story about the prodigal is that he came back home. Amen. Because of those things that his daddy put in him so he could make choices and make the right choices down the road. Praise God. Let me close with this. When my boy got out of church. He was about 21, 22 years old, got out of church. And he wasn't, he, he just, he, it was the cares and the riches of the world. He wanted to make money and it just like that. And he broke a heart. And so uh, I went to see him one day and I said this to him. I said, son, I said, uh, you, know, you know, I'm a preacher and you know I preach around. I said, I, I want you to just be honest. I said, I'm not mad. I just want some help. I said, I want you to tell me the areas that I messed up in your life, the things that I did wrong that caused you to get out of church. And uh, his, he teared up a little bit. He said, Dad, he said, you and Mom didn't do nothing wrong. He said, this was totally my decision. Most of the prodigals, you know what they would tell you? It wasn't mom and dad that made me go to the far country. It wasn't the church. My heart wasn't right. And I just made bad decisions. Amen? Amen. And so, my heart's desire for young parents is that you put vitally important things in those children so they can make right decisions. The fear of the Lord consequences, compassion on others, how to pray, that God, the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then for some of us older ones that our kids have gone to the far country, maybe not yet come back, you can't let the devil beat you up and take you down and get you out of the race. You're not a failure if you put those things in your child. Your child made their own decisions, and they will give account of it. And what God, what, what I always said to my wife when I finally realized 
that God didn't want me to get out or quit because of what happened with my kids. I told Nan, I said, babe, I said, you and I are going to be right where we've always been, living for God and serving God when those kids come back. And they'll know just where to find mom and dad. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I love you. I thank you for the privilege to preach at New Testament Baptist Church. I thank you for Pastor Rowan having confidence in me. And Lord, I pray the Holy Ghost would take the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, put it in our hearts that it would bring forth fruit for the glory of God. I pray you bless these parents, Father, as they... Lord, to have the great responsibility of bringing these children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And their heart's desire and their prayer is that their children would get saved and they'd live for God because they love God with all their hearts. And I pray that you'd bless them. And please bless Brother Rowan as he leads the invitation. I pray if the Holy Ghost spoke to hearts, people would mind the Lord. Let's stand to our feet. Just mind the Holy Spirit of God here tonight, church. The Lord has spoken to you. You know what He's talking to you about. You just obey that still small voice. 253. I wonder far away. chance to give yet that's uh, just give us the Lord is blessed you be seated if you want to tonight let's all stand and be dismissed in prayer good seeing each and every one of you and uh, brother Crawford won't you close us here tonight brother <laughs>